We live. Is it working on your side, Professor Essek? Uh, yes, I'm ready to go. Okay. Welcome, welcome all to uh, Africa for Palestine's uh, webinar, weekly webinar series for tonight. Uh, my name is Alex uh, and I am a volunteer at Africa for Palestine. Uh, the name of our weekly webinar series is Israeli Apartheid Through South African Eyes with Professor Farid Essak. And every week we have a different topic within that wider topic. So tonight's webinar is going to be about, the, the, the title's name is, The Choice to be Struck by Similarities or to be Blind to Them. Uh, it's about seven o'clock uh, here in South Africa, and we have this live streaming all over the world. Uh, so we welcome everyone who is joining us at this time. Um, for people who may be unfamiliar with us, um, Africa for Palestine focuses on strengthening African-Palestinian relations and pushing back against apartheid Israel's infiltration and influence into the continent of Africa. We work with solidarity groups trade unions, political formations, and human rights organizations across the African continent who have our same spirit of progressive internationalism and commitment to standing with other oppressed peoples of the world. Uh, tonight, we are very privileged uh, to continue our, our, webinar, our, our webinar series on Israeli apartheid through South African eyes with Professor Farid Essak. Uh, Professor Farid Essak is a South African Muslim liberation theologian and professor in the study of Islam at the Department of Religion Studies at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, he also currently serves on the board of Africa for Palestine. Uh, so we welcome you tonight, Professor Farid Essak. How are you doing? Uh, Alhamdulillah, Tamam. I'm very, very well. Um, first of all, a very happy, uh, even if belated, uh, Eid uh, Mubarak uh, for uh, Eid al-Fitr or Salamat Hari Raya uh, to our Malaysian and Indonesian friends. Um, I hope that you have had a wonderful uh, Eid, uh, inshallah. Um, <clears throat> right, so I'm ready uh, for you, uh, Alex. Let's go. Awesome. Um, so if there is uh, the first question I'd like to start off on, on this topic, uh, Professor Farida Sack, um, is what is it about the struggle for justice for Palestinians that makes you so deeply committed to that struggle? Um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, let me respond by way of speaking about another commitment of mine. You know, often uh, people uh, ask or uh, pro-Israeli people ask, you know, why are you singling out uh, Israel? Well, uh, most of us who are committed to the Palestinian struggle uh, actually see it as extensions of many other commitments. So let me uh, respond to this question by referring to another commitment of mine. I have for many years now been deeply committed to the struggle for gender justice. I've written extensively about the oppression of women in Muslim societies, and I've critiqued the Quranic scriptural justification for violence against women. I've served as a commissioner for gender equality in South Africa for five years in the first democratic government. And I guess I'm a veteran of many battles for gender justice, and I still slog on. So when I'm asked about what inspires me in this particular jihad, in the jihad for gender justice, I've often cited my experience living in Pakistan for about eight years as a madrasa student there. And there I came face to face with apartheid of another kind. Here in a Muslim society, I saw women being subjected to exactly the same kind of marginalization and oppression that I experienced as a black person in South Africa. And I was offered all the same theological justifications for patriarchal domination that were invoked in South Africa for white domination. It's biological, it's in the Quran, it's in our culture. But I saw gender apartheid. And as a South African, a black South African, 
coming from apartheid South Africa, I felt the right to make this uh, this kind of comparison. <clears throat> okay, so if, if we hear you correctly, <clears throat> Professor Essak, you're saying that um, the commitment for uh, your, your, your commitment to the struggle of, of Palestine and against apartheid Israel is rooted in a wider framework of intersectional or anti-oppression against any form of injustice. Absolutely. How, how, do, how do people respond when, when you make these kinds of comparisons? Well, people are very selective. If it's a comparison to, uh, an, to their own favorite oppression, say you talk about gender apartheid uh, in Pakistan or in Kuwait, uh, then they, and it's a white liberal society, then they're very happy for you to respond to this. So invariably, my ability to make these connections between different kinds of oppressions, it's welcomed by my frequently Western audiences as courageous, as principled, as prophetic. Uh, most of the time, they're not interested in the details of the comparison. The impact of the marginalization is the same. The logic of oppressing others by virtue of biology or your creation myths about derivative ontological, therefore secondary nature of another person, uh, women were derived from men, so they don't have a, an existence on their own. Blacks, uh, in the words of Mariki, the late Mariki de Klerk, F.W. de Klerk, apartheid's last president's wife, that uh, colored people were created as a second thought. They were the leftovers after God created humankind. So <clears throat> they respond differently. But uh, as I started using this analogy uh, in my presentations at workshops, say on social justice, social transformation and gender justice, I became curious about the different responses that it evoked. Many of the South African Muslim men, for example, readily recognized the foundational myths of apartheid because they were amongst its victims. But recognizing and exposing these myths meant an acknowledgement of wrongs done to them and it opened the possibility for redressing these through affirmative action in a post-apartheid South Africa. So when it came to connecting racism with sexism, then they, wait, you, you can't do this. Because men are no longer the victims. In fact, redressing the past injuries of a post-apartheid South Africa in a new, uh, the, the injuries of an apartheid South Africa in a post-apartheid South Africa, if you are committed to non-sexism, that could mean that a black male falls behind a black woman in the employment line. So often senior white civil servants, their responses were also interesting. They went along with my arguments in public because they needed job security in the new white South Africa. So they had little choice but to pay homage to the new country's orthodoxy of non-racialism and non-sexism. But often in my presentations, I would catch them making side glances at each other, mocking all of this, you know, oh, so sexism is the same as racism stuff. So <clears throat> the ability or the refusal of people to make different kinds of the connections between different kinds of oppression or different manifestations of, or, uh, of oppression it's very relevant in considering the question of Zionism as apartheid. People become very, very selective in what kind of comparisons they want to make. So when you speak about gender apartheid, many white liberals and Zionists are happy to jump on board. When you speak about Zionism as apartheid, then no, apartheid was unique to black people. Apartheid was, uh, no, uh, you demeaning black people in South Africa when you compare Zionism to apartheid. So this is really connected to, um, to their own uh, prejudices and very selective application of uh, principles. Thank yeah. you, Professor Essek. I, I think what you shared there was very important for us, especially as the struggle, uh, the Palestine solidarity struggle does become more mainstream and we deal more with liberals. Um, it's not to say that there are enemies, um, but we need different ways to win people over and challenge people. So 
I really appreciate these points that you've made in relation to multiple oppressions and the various forms of, of apartheid that we all face. Um, if I can move to my next question, um, are you able to tell us a little bit more about your first visits to Palestine, apartheid Israel, and your first impressions? Well, um, in, in my visits, now I've been there about eight times. Uh, the last time must have been about, I think, 10 years ago. Uh, in my visits there, I've always been astounded at the apartness of the existences of people. Even as the lives of its inhabitants, the Palestinian Arabs and the Jews, are so exorably intertwined, it is possible to move across large sections of the land and never encounter somebody from the other side. Perhaps uh, for the Palestinians who regularly encounter the other as a soldier, a policeman, a security guard protecting the bulldozers or the settlements. It's possible, for example, uh, in Jerusalem, in the old city, to have a shop right next to the one belonging to the other. Um, with the kind of proximity that you can only find in one in these Middle Eastern markets, perhaps also in African markets, in many African markets. I know I'm an Israeli Jew, you know, uh, his parents were Iraqis. He lived his entire life in Israel. Yet he met, in his words, the first ordinary, quote unquote, Palestinian at the age of 40. And like the vast majority of other Israeli Jews, he had until then encountered them only in the context of eating in their restaurants or having them clean Israeli seat, uh, streets. He met this quote unquote ordinary Palestinian in the course of his business as vice president of a large Israeli telecommunications company. And they met to discuss the prospects of having TV satellite uh, in Palestine. Afterwards, he told his brother-in-law how impressed he was by the fact that the Palestinian was well-dressed and he looked like a quote unquote normal businessman. And this guy, I mean, he did so with a childlike surprise because separateness had taught him that the Palestinians could not be clean and they can't be well-dressed. They can't be equals able to converse with him in regular business language. So for 40 years, how did this Israeli Jew not see? How did he choose to not see? Well, it's not so difficult, really. How do countless tourists come to this land year after year and not see? It's in Latin America the same. How do we see Montgomery, Alabama, and not, not in, Latin, in the United States? How do you see Montgomery, Alabama, and not see Gaza? The question is, are we ever compelled to be blind, to not know? In some ways, we see what we see, and what we see is determined by what we decide to see. That's just a part response to the first part of your question. What was it? You, you want to uh, just get back If, if to I you. can possibly ask Professor Essek, uh, how how were you treated upon arrival? You shared a bit about larger first impressions, but I'm just curious, how were you treated when you arrived um, at uh, the okay. border? Okay, now, first of all, the color of my skin, pigme skin pigmentation, that's a big one. My Arabic sounding name, and probably an intelligent scan of my past doings. Uh, <clears throat> the drama happens, sadly, it's quite, sick and painful to say this, but the drama actually happens already at the airport here in Johannesburg, if I'm not flying in from say Germany or something. Um, so all of these elements conspire to set me aside on any journey to uh, Israel. I'm not complaining that I'm being set aside. I think that as activists, we ought to know what we're letting ourselves for. Um, and in fact, I think that if you get thrown out or denied entry, if you get uh, treated like this, I think it's a bit of a badge of honor. You know, in, uh, during the years of the struggle against apartheid, um, there was one poster in the Christian Institute uh, 
the Christian Institute was a one of the struggle, one of the organizations in the liberation struggle. And the South African secret police at that time, the apartheid police, secret police were known as a special branch. So there was this wonderful poster in the Christian, Christian Institute's office where there's growth, there's bound to be a branch. And when there is special growth, there's bound to be a special branch. So we'll activists take this as an accolade. Of course, none of this means that we forego the right to protest and to remonstrate against being single out. And so often I feel other from the moment when I joined the airline check-in uh, queue uh, for my departure. I don't think it's unusual to be singled out for an extensive three to four hour interrogation by usually impeccably polite agents. And um, by the time of my last visit, I've grown used to it. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Um, and then of course, the questioning starts all over again, right from the beginning, um, when one arrives uh, at Tel Aviv's Ben Gurion International Airport. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I'm sorry to keep harping on this point. I mean, you shared a great deal about what it's like to encounter kind of the security apparatus, even as you're on the way to Israel, Palestine. Um, but can you possibly just share a bit more about what were your real first impressions upon arrival as a South African? Okay. I mean, uh... For South African, the sense of deja vu is inescapable immediately upon arrival um, there. Wait, let me rephrase that. For a South African who has lived or just survived under apartheid and who acted in solidarity with those who did, this sense of deja vu is a given. You are struck by this enforced separate, separateness. Um, in exchanging notes with some of my more socially conscious uh, Zionist South African friends about the initial encounter with Israel, they freely admit to me that they experience a compulsion to resist the immediate temptation to see it in this light. That from the moment of arrival until their departure in Israel, they have to engage in a constant, pain, painfully, mostly successful, exercise in self-rationalization and self-explanation with much assistance from others keen to clarify that this situation here is different. Now, in some ways, all of us are the children of our history. The relevance of our own stories, more painfully, the irrelevance of the stories of others. Yet, we also choose to be struck by the stories of others. And the extent to which we exercise this choice to choose to be struck by the stories of others, I think that this is the barometer of our humanness. You are a, bi you are a biological entity without a conscience, without a conscience, without this choice. But you choose to be struck by the stories of other people. This to me indicates your humanness. But to come back, uh, Alex, to your more direct question. My first visit, and I may be going off track again here, but my first visit to That's Palestine okay. was during the beginning of the first Intifada in 1988. Our own liberation struggle was reaching new heights. As someone deeply involved in that struggle, it was very difficult to look at the state of Israel through benign eyes. Here was a country founded in response to many impulses, including, I must emphasize, a response to the savagery of Nazism. But for me as a South African, this was a country that was arming an unashamedly racist South African regime, which had supported the Nazis to the hill. Apartheid South Africa was born partly from Afrikaner suffering inside British concentration camps in South Africa and ideologically deeply inspired by Hitler's Nazism. This apartheid South Africa 
Israel was a country that supplied much of the arms that killed our children on a daily basis. Yeah, in Israel, I found myself in a country that had turned, and I'm quoting Hunter here, that had turned its unique preferential trade privileges with both the United States and the European economic community into a springboard onto world markets for South African goods, unquote. It was much later that I became aware that several of the neighboring Arab countries had also been active in breaking sanctions against South Africa. Israel though, along with the United States, was one of the few countries, you can count them on a single hand, that sided openly with apartheid South Africa on numerous occasions in the United Nations. It was only on my fourth or fifth visit there, well after the end of apartheid, when I first ventured into the western part of Jerusalem to meet with some organizations working on issues of gender justice. And yes, on that visit, I also went on the first number of visits after that to Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem is Israel's monument to the victims of the Holocaust. So here, yeah, donning a paper kippah, I wept freely at the memory of the millions of Jews and others killed in the Holocaust. I wept at the invective, the abuse that I had recently heard being spouted by an Egyptian preacher, the late Sheikh Muhammad Kish. Al-Yahud, Al-Yahud, Ihdar al-Yahud, the Jews, the Jews, watch out for the Jews. I wept at the hatred that I saw so liberally flung at the ahistorical, the Jews, during the eight years of my theological training in Pakistan at the capacity of man, yes, man, to inflict suffering on humankind. And I wept at the inabilities of the planners of this memorial to spare a candle for the many, uh, for the many, uh, um, for the, the gypsies, the homosexuals, also killed by the Nazis. And I wept for the tragedy of the Palestinian people whom Edward Said had so aptly described as the victims of the victims. A population who now had to endure dispossession because of the unspeakable crimes that some white people committed against other white people. So these are some of my early impressions of encountering um, apartheid Israel. Sure, Professor Essak. Um you're really taking us on, on quite a journey. I mean, myself, and I'm sure many viewers included, um, your, your vivid descriptions and lived experience of bearing witness to the oppression of the Palestinians, but all the different nuanced ways that uh, there were so many other oppressions happening, uh, multiple histories converging. No, that's, it's, it's been a really, really, um, yeah, thank you for, for taking us uh, in your shoes or walking with us in your shoes. We, we really appreciate this. Um, can I possibly ask now? Um, you can ask anything possibly, uh, Alex. You don't have to ask for permission to ask. I'm being interviewed for uh, Africa for Palestine. Uh, uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, comrade Professor Essek. Um, okay, so if I can possibly ask, uh, how does the, the story of the, the new non-racial South Africa being achieved partly as a result of the international community's boycott of apartheid how does that resonate with you as someone who is very involved in the ongoing struggle against apartheid Israel? Look, at the time of my first visit to Palestine, that was in the mid eighties, there were as at that time, there were yet no sustained calls for any boycotts or disinvestment from Israel. I was however deeply aware that I could only justify coming here 
by being very clear that my visit was an act of personal solidarity. I also understood that by coming here, I made a political choice. I come from a country where we, well, not all of us, most of us, we called upon the conscience of the world to stay away from this country. We expected all decent people throughout the world to heed the call for economic, academic, and cultural sanctions against South Africa. We called for divestment from our country, despite the fact that for the apartheid regime, it was a crime of treason to do so. Chief Albert Lutuli, and if I, yeah, I'm, I'm a recipient, I'm, I'm a member of the order of Lutuli. Um, it's a state awarded honor. So Chief Albert Lutuli, <clears throat> Uh, who passed away in 1967, a father of our nation, a Nobel Prize winner. He appealed to the world as early as 1960, and I quote him, we welcome most heartily the action of overseas people in launching the boycott. Our hope is really this, that we can bring, bring pressure to bear on South Africa, and that through this pressure, South Africa will change its way of dealing with non-Europeans. We know as African people that we as an oppressed people will never gain our freedom without suffering. But to us, it is a demonstration of the solidarity of the freedom loving peoples throughout the world. We must pursue a policy of non-violence up to the limit. We therefore welcome your decision to boycott as we are convinced that nothing but good can flow out of all of our efforts directing, directed against defeating a policy which seeks to perpetuate Afrikaner domination and exploitation of the millions of African people. That was Chief Albert Lutuli in 1960. So throughout the years of the boycotts against South Africa, we continue to welcome visitors from the United Nations, friendly governments and international solidarity activists. Other people were less welcome or completely unwelcome. They came. Besides the rather few political allies of white South Africa, these were investors and tourists. Some of them were probably very nice folk, all claiming innocence and being apolitical, but we despised them. They came at the invitation of white South Africa. They had the money and the freedom to do with it as they pleased. Many of these tourists and investors, they returned to their countries abroad, not surprisingly enchanted with our astonishingly beautiful country, what it had to offer, and completely ignorant, indifferent, oblivious of any reality beyond the black faces that smiled at them. They would go around saying, oh, I've been to South Africa myself, and don't be fooled by all this propaganda. The Blacks are really very happy there. Of course, the Black people that they encountered uh, smiled at them. It's uh, the name of the game, uh, survival. If you want to survive, you smile at these white people. Doesn't mean that, uh, that they like you, doesn't mean that they really welcome you, but that is the game of survival and we were entitled to it. So yeah, um, the boycott against uh, Israel long before it was announced, we believed in it because we recognized the same society that we had suffered under uh, inside South Africa. Mm. If, if I can possibly just uh, interject for a moment, Professor Asak, we may have people who are joining a bit later as we begin to, as we begin our descent uh, from uh, about halfway through our, our um, our time together during the webinar, but our webinar series for all of our viewers who have joined us a bit late um, is about Israeli apartheid through South African eyes with uh, none other than Pro Professor Farid Essek, whom we have here today, tonight. And our tonight's specific uh, topic is the choice to be struck by similarities or to be blind to them. Uh, and Professor uh, Essek has really shared with us a very uh, riveting and critical account of his journeys uh, in the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, but also in solidarity 
with the anti-apartheid struggle in Palestine. Um, and uh, at the moment, I would like to ask him kind of a more specific question. Um, we just celebrated the end of Eid, uh, the, the end of the holy month of, of fasting for, uh, uh, for Muslims. So I was just kind of thinking, um, Palestine, Israel is known as the holy, holy land. And you just were speaking about how people visited apartheid South Africa as tourists and visitors. What about all these religious pilgrims who visit the Holy Land? Yeah, uh, of course. I mean, the, uh, the Holy Land also sees many a religious tourist and a sincere pilgrim. It is, after all, for Christians, the birthplace uh, of all the foundation stories of their faith and its precursor, Judaism. It is above all for devout Jews, the land of the second temple. Here at the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall, however you want to call it, a retaining wall of that temple, thousands of Jews gather every day to mourn the destruction of the temple. They yearn for closer proximity to what they regard as the holy of holies. And they insert deeply personal messages to God, to Hashem in folded papers into the crevices and the crannies of the wall. So I stand there, I stand as an outsider and I observe them, and my heart goes out to them. But while I look at all of these men, I also choose to see and I choose to see the women at the edges of the wall on the far right side, divided by a mechitza, and the unsuccessful legal struggle of these women since 1988 to secure the right to pray at the wall, uh, wearing a talit, this prayer shawl, to pray out aloud and to read from the Torah. And I look at these women and I, I put myself in their shoes. And at the same time, I wonder if any of these women see a connection between their struggles for space in a men's world when maleness must mean control and possession of the center between their struggles and that of the Palestinians in a world uh, where in dispossession and displacement of the non-us, this ethnic non-us, you're not Jew, or this non-us religious, you're not Jew, how this is inherently tied to their idea of a collective progressive Jewish identity. This on the one hand. On the other hand, there are these numerous Christian religious tourists. They're simply not interested in what they call the current controversy. And for me, you know, it's like walking into a house of immense historic and symbolic value and beauty. And you're being welcomed into this house by the current owner. You may get to notice a door we are not allowed to enter into. You may even hear muffled cries from behind the door, but you trust the owner because the owner shares your race. He shares your class. He shares your religion or religious Christian Judeo background, your civilizational background, or you shares your, he shares your gender interest. He keeps on assuring you that, no, 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 he's in charge. And that the cries you hear from the behind the door, it's not real. Uh, if it is real, then look, you know, there's people, they're just having some domestic problems. And besides, you know, wives, you know, wives, I mean, uh, they require a, bit of a good thrashing now and then. I mean, you know, domestic abuse, after all, it's well, kind of, it's domestic. So can we kind of ignore the cries that we hear in this room next door and just move on and I'll show you all the rest of the beauty that this historic uh, and symbolic huge uh, house has to offer you. And uh, trust me, you know, it's kind of nothing serious that all this noise around us is uh, mm. that, that, you're, that you're hearing. Yeah. So if, if we're hearing you correctly, Professor Asak, it seems to me that you're, you're getting at the fact that in any given context, there are always multiple stories, multiple histories happening. And this kind of ties into uh, what you shared with us in last week's webinar about the history of Israel-Palestine and what it means to pick uh, 
sides in history. So if, uh, if I can ask, why should we be struck by the story of any one particular side in this uh, Palestine-Israel so-called conflict? Why yeah. should we not be listening to both sides? Yeah. Okay. Well, first, of all, yeah. first of all, I'm glad that you spoke to it about a so-called Israel-Palestinian conflict. Uh, it could have been worse. You could have spoken about the Israeli-Arab conflict or what people say, the Middle East situation. When you describe, when you describe things in these, you know, husband-wife dispute, meanwhile, I think it was, yeah, I may have referred to this before, husband-wife dispute, meanwhile, it is about the woman getting a beating from the, uh, the husband. What does this say about us, our own power interests, and our refusal to have our own comfort zones described, disturbed? Um, because if you describe violence against women as violence against women instead of um, instead of a domestic uh, in, uh, instead of saying it's a domestic dispute, wait, you risk alienating the male partner. And if that <coughs> abusive male husband is also your business partner or possibly your boss or your primary donor or your biggest customer of your business, then things can get really sticky. So. In cowardice, really, we walk away saying, look, you know, I don't really want to get into the middle of this. Um, this on the one hand. On the other hand, you could delude yourself and you walk away by a man, you know, some conciliatory mutterings without ever addressing the question of abuse. Um, <clears throat> I'll return probably later in the conversation to this, to the appropriateness of this analogy. For now, <clears throat> the question that people in the global north must ask, more specifically white people, what interests of race, class, common European heritage, civilizational values, or economic interests are served by your defensiveness, by your refusal to connect the dots, or by your inability to speak once you have connected these dots. Uh, two colleagues, uh, Heribert Adam and Kojela Mudli, they raised the point um, slightly more gently. And let me, yeah, with, I open my quote. We are puzzled as to why morally sensitive individuals react allergically to the slightest condemnation of Israeli behavior. People who rightly celebrate the Jewish overrepresentation in the anti apartheid struggle react uncomfortably when the possibility of Israeli apartheid is merely queried. Amiable conversation turns sour, and the non kosher topic is dropped with consensual self censorship. Prominent liberal defenders the world over explicitly state that they will not venture into this emotional minefield, unquote. So a while ago, you know, I won't mention his name. <clears throat> um, I had a long conversation with a really good friend of mine. He's very well known internationally and he's widely traveled scholar of liberation theology. And I asked him about his apparent inability to connect the dots, at least publicly dots between his commitment to justice and his seeming indifference to the quote unquote situation in Palestine. Uh, he replied and said, no, I do make the connection. He said, I often share my views with my wife. They're wonderful people, by the way, a lot of love and affection for them. In listening to my friend, I somehow had the image of an adult watching a child playing connecting the dots. Now, in most of these puzzles <clears throat> um, <clears throat> for toddlers, the picture is fairly obvious. The adult sees the child making pencil scribblings all over the page and without touching the dots, and the adult quickly walks away, usually because uh, they want to foster creativity and enjoy being a part of this learning process. But there is something more to this than the case of playing along silently with liberal Zionists and their refusal or their inability to connect the dots. It's 
the fear of losing the child's friendship by alerting the child to the picture obscured by the dots? Is it a fear of the tantrum that the child is going to throw when you do so? Especially if that child has a well-deserved tent reputation for tantrums. Whenever the child is confronted with the reality of his or her own bad behavior, children are not beyond being manipulative. So very often, Zionists prevent others from seeing the dots because they establish a pattern of throwing tantrums. They know what the truth is, but the bigger their tantrums are, the slower you are going to be in speaking the truth to their power. So there is value in all of this tantrum for them. The real picture, of course, that if you connect the dots that is made, it's not a nice one. It is for the Palestinians, in fact, one of a seemingly innocent child as a monster. The child wants to continue viewing the adult, sorry, the adult wants to continue viewing the child as innocent in large part because that adult imagines its own abuse as responsible for the child turning into a monster. And here, don't forget, white Westerners, white Europeans were after all responsible for the Holocaust. So they, at the back of their heads, they know that they are the creators of this child having turned into a monster. And that's why they play along, and never wanting to make the dots. The global north, the white world, has enormous strategic and financial interest in the geopolitical location, the role that this monster is playing. So I asked my friend to get back to that story about the silence. And he said something about wanting to keep the conversation going. Oh, OK. So this is our conversation, a Judeo-Christian conversation, trying sometimes to drag Muslims into it in the name of interfaith dialogue. But this conversation never includes the plight of the Palestinians. It's about not wanting to alienate friends. Perhaps it is about this. For me, it is, however, about conversations in this uncritic dialogue enterprise that is really wedded to our careers and our jobs on the one hand. And on the other hand, and this is the saddest reality, it is about our own alienation from a principled commitment to justice. Mm. Sure, that's deep, uh, Professor Essek. Um, you've really given us a lot to chew on. Um, and as we, we kind of near the end of our time together on this webinar today, I, I, I wanted to know how many more questions can you take? Um, I have about one to two. Should we stick to one or? We can do two. Uh, okay. Yeah, the patients of our viewers may be wearing thin also. Okay, okay, then, okay, I'll go ahead with this one. Um, so we, we hear what you're saying. Um, but I'm, I'm curious of another kind of aspect of this psychologically. Um, there are many, there are many decent, decent uh, people who, who continue to support Israel. No? What um, do we do about that and with them? Uh, yes, uh, it's one of my own kind of uh, real curiosities, you know. In the, in the United States, they have an expression for it. Um, um, uh, pro, uh, PEP, PEP, progressive except Palestine. You're progressive about every cause under the sun except uh, Palestine, yes. So yeah, these are the, the questions of these peps. <clears throat> I'm often astounded really at how ordinary decent people whose hearts are in the right place, they equivocate. They go this way, la ilaha ula'i wa la ilaha ula'i. Uh, when it comes to Israel and the dispossession and suffering of the Palestinians. And I wonder, yes, you, you describe them as decent, so do I. But I also wonder about the nature of decency. Does decency, objectivity, moderation, both sides, do they not have context? 
is moderation in matters of manifest injustice really a virtue? Do both sides deserve an equal hearing in a situation of domestic violence where a woman gets beaten up by a male because that male was abused by uh, his father some years ago because the victim is also a victim? Why must someone else suffer because the husband was abused by some other figure yesterday? Whose story are we really tuned into? And whose interest do we serve by tuning into a side that we do by opting for an illusionary neutrality? You know, uh, Alex, let me tell you this story about uh, Union Theological Seminary in New York, uh, where I taught more than 20 years ago. <clears throat> Um, it's a citadel of Christian progressive thinking. At Union, I often got the impression that heterosexual white males came there in order to confess their sinful ontological status before God or goddess or before it. Students and faculty embraced every, the cause of every conceivable marginalized group on the face of the earth. It was like the ideal progressive place. Two hours after the first of the Twin Towers collapsed on the 11th of September, 2001, at a service in the chapel, it was amazing. One of the students asked the worshipers to never forget that those two towers themselves represented a a horrible form of economic terrorism against people of the two third world. Huh? This, was, this was Union Theological Seminary. In uttered and in spoken discourse though, for all the faculty and staff there, Palestine and Palestinians could just as well have been a place in outer space. Professor Mark Ellis, one of the most profound contemporary prophetic voices amongst Jews speaks about a deal struck between Union Theological Seminary and the Hebrew Theological Seminary just across the road, a deal of silence. Union represents best how a genuine and much needed Christian respect, uh, in the words of Mark Ellis, a Christian respect for the authenticity of Jewish life and the right of Jews to define themselves has in many cases evolved into simple Christian cowardice, unquote. The, the discussion on Palestine is best left to our dialogue partners across the road. And to get back to Mark Ellis again, in this need to keep the conversation going, the demonized Jew replaces the romantic Jew. Unlike Germany, as Alice points out, where there is no sizable Jewish community, American Christians often interact with a sizable and an empowered contemporary Jewish community. So to keep a romanticized view means interacting other control, under control circumstances with certain Jewish elites. And in this, interaction, entire areas of discourse, such as Palestine, are off limits. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I have just one more question left, uh, Professor Essek. Um, you've really given us a, a lot of very interesting uh, stuff to chew on tonight. Um, and I think it kind of all wraps itself up and, and, and almost ties itself together in this last question. We've been talking about competing histories, competing claims to the land, the case of South Africa, the case of Israel, both as apartheid contexts. So in this specific example, in your insistence on looking at the oppression of the Palestinians, where does the issue of even handedness or might we say objectivity fit in if we want to talk about justice and 
I mean, yeah. look, it's a very uh, selective demand, <clears throat> you know. The objectivity that uh, in decoloniality, in, uh, in areas of race, gender, sexuality, <clears throat> Uh, through and all of this, postmodern scholars, postcolonial thinkers, feminists, liberation theologians, all the others have long since debunked the myth of objectivity. And they've insisted on disclosure as a precondition to dialogue. <clears throat> Tell us about your class interests. Tell us about your gender interests. What are the lenses through which you view the world? In a quote that I've arguably overused in my work, David Tracy, the famous Catholic theologian insists, there is no historyless, discourseless human being. So when you deny the lenses through which you're looking at an issue, it's really tantamount to the acceptance of the dominant status quo. When I walk through the district, uh, and I'm thinking more particularly now of Germany and of the Netherlands, uh, where sex is on sale, I can choose to see it through the eyes of a sex tourist, or I can see it through the eyes of a sex worker. And I'm not saying that all of them are sold into the trade, but that's very often the case, sold into the trade or driven there by poverty and exploitation. So I choose to look at Palestine and Israel through the eyes of the marginalized and the exploited. I choose to privilege this perspective over other perspectives. Is it, what am I seeing in front of me? Is it sex tourism or is it sexual exploitation? Or worse, is it a refusal to name it and a preference to speak about it, the seemingly neutral, look, you know, just coming out to have some fun. We're just here to relax. What, what do you name it? This depends on where you see yourself located in the power structure. My story earlier on about Union Theological Seminary, it reflects a pattern in liberal thinking in much of the West, a willingness to locate oneself ideologically, but to do so very, very carefully with an eye to not upsetting the apple cart of power. So the last point that I want to make, uh, Alex, is this. Whether you want to choose sides or not, we are in the middle of it. We're in the middle of this battle because we do business with the abusive husband. And or we profit from his abuse of his wife. And uh, we sustain his delusions that he is okay. Israel is okay. Israel is a part of the civilized world. We seek refuge in this whole bull. Both sides have a story to tell as a way of dodging our own complicity. Rather than us merely <clears throat> hallowing <clears throat> um, the exploiter, the colonizer, with a mantle of respectability, our silence draws us into a web of complicity. I'm saying, however small a minority those Germans may have been, those Germans who refused to turn a blind eye to the persecution of the Jews by the Nazis, those Germans who refused to be silent, they were the only Jews who were really civilized. The only Germans who were really civilized. All the other Germans who did not speak, who did not observe and, or if you can use this hadith, you know, the saying of the prophet, at least be ill in your heart about what you are seeing. <coughs> All the others had Jewish blood on their hands. So to talk about the Jewish-German conflict uh, when the Jews were being killed in their millions by the Nazis, or to talk about the black-white situation in South Africa during the years of apartheid, or to talk about marital problems in the face of um, domestic abuse, it is no great virtue. 
or in Urdu they say, Kamal ki baat nahi hai. It is the path of initially acquiescence and ultimately it is the, the path of complicity in the crimes against the Palestinian people. And if I may end uh, it on that note, Alex, I'd be delighted. Thank you very much. And thanks to the people who were listening to me over to you for your last uh, comment or two, Alex. But uh, just don't uh, exaggerate the extent of my wisdom or whatever. Well, thank you uh, for this very specific wisdom, if you would not mean to, to not over exaggerate, uh, Professor Essek. Uh, thank you very much for, for your time, for sharing um, your analysis, um, your, your personal stories, but also I think the stories of so many other people um, in Palestine, in apartheid Israel, on the margins in many places. Um, I think myself and much of the viewers uh, were enriched by what you shared. Uh, we were challenged, definitely. And hopefully this galvanizes us to, to continue the struggle um, and to continue to fight for a more just world, whether, um, I mean, more specifically against apartheid Israel, but I think really anywhere. So um, yeah, shukran, thank you. Merci, shukriya. Uh, and until Rafi, next week, you, until next week, the same time. Okay. <laughs> yes, to you, Professor Essak, and to all of our viewers. Um, we will be seeing Professor Essak next week, continuing his webinar series on uh, Israeli apartheid through South African eyes. And next week's topic is going to be how applicable is the term apartheid to the state of Israel? So uh, we encourage all of our viewers and their friends and their networks to join us next Wednesday, June 3rd, 7 p.m. South Africa time, uh, which correlates to, to many times across the world, of course. Uh, yeah, so we encourage you to, to come check in with us. Uh, and lastly, for those who have joined late or may not be familiar with us, we just would like to share again that uh, Africa for Palestine, formerly known as BDS South Africa, focuses on strengthening African-Palestinian relations and pushing back against apartheid Israel's infiltration and influence into the continent of Africa. We work with solidarity groups, trade unions, political formations, and human rights organizations across the African continent who have our same spirit of progressive internationalism and commitment to standing with other oppressed peoples of the world. We are actually at the moment for all of us under lockdown, uh, apologies, this is only for our South African audience at the moment, at least. We are selling these amazing, wonderful, really, really cool and great quality kufiye, Palestinian kufiye face masks. Uh, please check out our social media, Africa for Palestine on Twitter, Facebook, uh, to figure out how to order yourself one. They are all locally made here in South Africa with the kufiye, this traditional Palestinian scarf coming from Palestine itself. Uh, so check it out in addition, in addition to checking us out next week. Thanks to all. Everyone have a great rest of your night or day.